All right, so we've been studying for the last uh, uh, two months. We've been studying, maybe even more than that, the book of Romans. The book of Romans. I have one more week on this, and then Dr. Green will come and um, uh, sum total the whole book of Romans. But we wanted to look at uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. That should be a very familiar text to all of us. It's the way you think. The way you think, being transformed <coughs> by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. Dr. Green mentioned it three or four weeks ago. I want you to keep in mind, there are four major shifts in the book of Romans. Everybody say four. four. Uh, first of all, he starts off with the wrath of God. Then he follows up the wrath of God with the grace of God. Then the third shift in the text is the plan of God. And the fourth shift we're about to read in Romans chapter 12 is the will of God. Let's look at it together. This is very important. First, we have the wrath of God. That's chapters 1, 2, and 3. Then we, after we get past Romans chapter 3, verse number 23, then you start walking into the grace of God. When you get to around uh, chapter uh, 7 and 8, you start revealing, God started revealing the plan, well, actually, chapter 5 and 6, the plan of God, and we are all one, regardless if you're Jew or Gentile, we're all one in grace. And chapter 12 starts working out the will of God. All right? Now, a lot of us love to stop at the grace of God. Because the grace of God is revealed with or without you. But God, once you reveal the grace of God, then you start praying, praying, God, let me be in the plan of God. So I can eventually fulfill the will of God. Are, are y'all with me? So that's important. We like to find out that grace neg uh, 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 negates wrath. But now we get ourselves in the will of God. Now, I want you to look at something. I think I mentioned this. I can't remember. I slept since then. But I think I looked, we looked at four different shifts scripturally that you and I need to look at. And there's four different shifts uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse number 19, Romans chapter 5, verse number 1, Romans chapter 8, verses number 1, and then Romans chapter 12 is the last shift. Uh, to the end of the chapter that we need. Can we look at these real quick? And I won't be long because I only have two verses for you. Romans chapter 3, when you read out the King James Version, there are some, some uh, therefores. In the original text, it would have said therefore. Every time the, um, um, when Paul mentions the word therefore, he is mentioning it because it's there for a reason. My daddy used to say, anytime you read therefore, you need to find out what is therefore. Okay? And every time he, he gives us four, um, uh, this text, I think I accidentally put it in the New Living Translation. That was on me. But it was, therefore the law applies to those whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and show that the entire world is guilty before God. That's the first shift. The first shift is in Romans chapter 3, or the, the first therefore is in Romans chapter 3, verse number 19. Now, let me explain what that is uh, dealing with. That is dealing with the condemnation of God. Are y'all with me? The condemnation of God. We are condemned if we try to get right without Jesus. Thank you, Sean. We are condemned if we try to get right with God without Jesus, okay? And, and what you actually find out before he starts presenting Jesus, he said he don't care how long you've been in church, you, you condemned. He don't care what church you go to, you condemned. He don't care if you are a paganist, a moralist, a person who lives morally right, or a religionist, any of those subtracted from God, from Jesus dying on the cross, you're condemned. Are y'all with me? That's the first therefore. The second third therefore is in Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. Look what the Bible says in, in um, chapter 5, verse number 1. 
Therefore, everybody said therefore. therefore. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, look what you have now. We have peace with God because of what? Not you did in baptism, not what church you went to, not how many scriptures you know, not how many times you pray, nor how many times you give. You are right with God through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So he starts off with condemnation, but thank God for therefore, because he, he fixes condemnation with justification. Now let me explain what justification, not just as you have done something, is because he did something, he treats you just as if you hadn't done anything. Are y'all with me? That, that's why a Christian can't be arrogant. Because you know you're wrong. You were in court and you were guilty on all 38 charges. Yeah, you paid the hush money. <laughs> okay, y'all ain't going to sit there. You were guilty. And in fact, I had more than 38 charges. I had a life full of charges. So I was guilty. I had been found guilty, but before the gavel came down, Jesus stepped in. And that blood was still dripping from the cross. And said, so, yeah, he's guilty, but my grace abounds even the more. Are y'all with me? And just because you have received Jesus through faith does not mean that you're still not in a sin state. Because Romans 3.23 says we're still trapped in this body. You still mess up. But thank be to God for his grace. So, so first of all, he starts off with condemnation. Then he goes to justification in Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. And then Romans chapter 8. Uh, look, look, Romans chapter 8. This is a text that you, you, you and I really need to uh, work on. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Green will really dig into it. Because <laughs> we have trouble in our, in our theological context dealing with this text. Uh, so now, or therefore, there is no condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. So look what he does. Now, it is bad to be found guilty and you don't have to go to uh, jail. But you still got a record. Uh, so what this does, Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. Verse number 8, chapter 1, not only deals with condemnation, not only deals with justification, but what Jesus does on the cross is he exonerates. Uh, Richard Miles, uh, brother Richard Miles, uh, he came and preached for us uh, years ago, um, about four or five years ago, and he was found guilty of a life sentence for murder. Uh, back in 1978, uh, he was walking home from McDonald's where he was working. Uh, uh, a police officer pulled up and handed him a gun and said, let me see how this gun fit in your hand. Yep. Had his fingerprints in it and he was convicted of double murder. Yep. Had a full scholarship to go to Prairie View. And um, when, when, when it all came out, the forensics came back and they found out that the police officer had, had lied and all of a sudden, because of some law students out of Duke, they worked through it, found out that this police officer had done that to many other people. Isn't it amazing they never go back and put that person in jail? Yeah. For everything you're going to give me, you should have gave him. But anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Amos chapter 4. Um, <clears throat> but, but he became free. But when he came here to preach, he said, being free from prison, meant nothing until they cleared my record. He said it was four years after I had become free from prison that I was able to be free. Now I could walk around and do what I wanted to do, but everywhere I went, they would pull up my record because it hadn't been expunged. <laughs> you missed it. To be free in Christ, but everywhere you go, somebody keep pulling up your sins and still make me free guilty. That's why, that's why you shouldn't keep repeating to yourself what you've done. The, the grace of God has, exp, has expunged everything that you have done and you ought not keep doing it. But somewhere along the way, you ought to live in the blessings which is today 
Because you know your God took care of everything on that cross. Are y'all with me? Yeah. So first of all, you have condemnation. I'm going to get to the text. You have condemnation in the first three chapters out of Romans chapter 3, verse number 19. You have, uh, um, uh, you have um, exoneration in Romans chapter 8, um, verse number 1. You have justification in verse chapter 5, verse number 1. But then look at what you have in Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. Here's our text for today. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living sacrifice. So we go from condemnation to justification to exoneration to consecration. Chapter 12, verse number 1 is consecration. Let's, let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. All right. I want to read it. I want to read it in two different versions. I want to read it in the New Living Translation, and then I want to read it in the King James Version. That's the text you're most familiar with. Let me read it in the New Living Translation. Um, and so, dear, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them, your bodies, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find access, acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Isn't that amazing? This is the way to worship him. So worship is bigger than Sunday. It's a daily thing, isn't it? How, how do I worship God? Because I present my body as a tool for God to use. So here's the challenge. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform or metamorphize you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is what will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Isn't that beautiful? Let's read out the King James Version for you uh, old-time biblical scholars. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, <clears throat> which is only reasonable. And to be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is a perfect will of God. All right, let's talk about it for a second. You got to remember, Paul is uh, preaching to all of us or teaching or sending a letter to all of us, but I want you to look at the audience. Uh, they would understand what it means to give a sacrifice because they're still under a temple system, Okay. One thing I love about the Christians at that time, they were not like us, who when we find something new, we separate ourselves. When they find something new, they live different, but they kept going back to the synagogue. We, when we think we got the truth, we remove our truth from everybody who we don't think have a truth. You know, I found out you don't really know what truth you have if you're only willing to talk about the person, or talk with the person who has the same truth you have. If you are unwilling to let somebody challenge your truth, then your truth might be a little frail. I, try, I like to talk to everybody. They, they would believe in Jesus. They, they got most of the Romans who are, Paul hadn't made it there. Paul is one establishing churches all across the, 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 uh, what, what this would be known as the uttermost parts of the world. So they would, they would gather together, but they had no problem going back to the synagogue uh, to listen to the word of God. Yeah. All right? The system didn't dictate their behavior. Yeah. Are y'all with me? Yeah. So what they would do is, because you, sometimes you got to go back in the fire to get other people out. Yeah. Um, so they, they would go back. So they understood the, un, the concept of a sacrifice. Uh, a priest would give a sacrifice on behalf of the sins of the people. Y'all remember that? 
in the, in the book of Leviticus and Exodus, that was to roll your sins back. So now, if you don't need that anymore because Jesus forgave you of sins, what's your sacrifice? Paul said, you still got to give a sacrifice. But your sacrifice is not dead. It's living. Are y'all with me? Y'all stay with me now. What do you mean a living sacrifice? How, Paul, how do I get, so I don't have to go buy a bull and a goat that, that's being overcharged in front of the temple anymore. So if I still got to give a sacrifice, how do I give it? Paul said, when you wake up in the morning, you present your body as a living sacrifice. Now, now let, let's talk. Can we talk about that for a second? Uh, how do I present my body as a living sacrifice? I got to beat myself up so I can present what God intended. This, the Bible talks about you got to kill yourself. What, what am I killing? I'm killing that stuff that's killing me. Yes. I'm killing anything that subtracts me or puts me not in harmony with God. This text tore me up uh, this week because it tore me up because I don't know how well I'm presenting my body. Now, don't, don't always go towards a sexual behavior. Ain't none of that. Everybody's sleeping at 315. <laughs> we go to bed early. Ain't none of that. But Am I eating right? What's my conversation look like? Because I want you to catch it. You can present a front on Sunday but still be corrupt internally. Is your mind wrong? Are you gossiping? Are you talking? Are you deceitful? Do you say one thing to one person and then say something else to somebody else? How are you? Do you hate people? Because you can get up there and say, our God is an awesome God, but you ain't presenting nothing right. because your mind is playing tricks on you. Yeah. So what he says, what he says in the text, he says, I beseech you therefore, uh, brethren and uh, sistering, brethren and sistering, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, uh, holy and acceptable. So look what he says. First of all, he says living. Everybody say living. living. A living sacrifice is a deliberate ongoing sacrifice given over and over. Now let me tell you what the problem with the living sacrifice. It's easy to deal with a dead sacrifice because it won't move. Are y'all with me? The problem is some of us put ourselves on the altar but we squirm off. Everybody in here, have you ever said I'm going to recommit the only reason you got to recommit because you uncommitted. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get my life. How many people have made deathbed confessions? Lord, have you ever been so sick that you said, Lord, if it been thy dwelling place through all generations, before the mountains were made, they're they going to have to give me a key. The elders are going to give me a key to the building because every time it's open, <laughs> I'm going to be in the house of prayer. And that lasts for a month. And then you say, because a living sacrifice is beautiful, but a living sacrifice takes daily decisions to present myself to God. Are, are you with me? So it's deliberate, it's ongoing, it is living, and it's done for a lifetime. So I don't care if you're 90. You wake up in the morning and said, God, help me present myself. Why, why do I have to present myself? Because God's presentation needs your body. Okay? Because if I'm the hands and the feet of God and I'm negative, what am I presenting God as? If I'm deceitful at work and talking about folks and manipulative and trying to mess up folks' jobs, what am I presenting? If, if I'm a bad neighbor in my neighborhood, what am I presenting? If I'm, if I'm hating people and not treating folks right, I'm presenting God as a negative yes, God because 
if he is capsulated in who I am, I ought to be presenting him with joy. You know why I know that? Because it says in verse number one of, of Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living uh, and holy sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. How do I present myself? I present myself by reminding myself of the self that God got me out of. How can I wake up in the morning and have joy? Just remember what the Lord has done for you. Uh, uh, what, just remember how he has blessed you with good decisions and the decisions you made that were bad. And he worked all of that out, Romans chapter 8, verse number 28, to the praise of his glory. The decisions where people told you no and you wanted to say yes. The house that you didn't get, the job that fired you from, the car that they rejected you from, the relationship that you wanted that God didn't let you ever dial in. You got to do that gumbo and look at it. Had it not been for the Lord on my side. So when I look at everything, he's worked out in this tapestry of my spiritual being and he has presented my life as glory to him. I ought to be able to wake up on a rainy morning and say, glory be to God. How can I serve you today? I mean, that's just reasonable, ain't it? It'll help you with your back problems when you start recognizing he's a good God. It'll help you with your isolation when you start recognizing he's a good God. People who have smiled in your face and want to take your place, and you say, man, glory be to God. I love him because God had to push me over here and push me over there until he got me where he wanted me to be. Man, I tell you what, I thank God for being fired. That's the best thing that ever happened to me. I needed that. Amen, somebody. I needed that. I thank God for the relationships that God blocked. Because yeah. he was just trying to give me the Melanese. It's a blessing. Amen. Yeah. I saw a girl at, at the grocery store that I dated way before Melanese. And I called her and said, guess who's in the grocery store? And I told her who. And she said, you made some good choices, didn't you? <laughs> I said, I sure did, because she like, she was tired. I mean, <laughs> life had grabbed her. <laughs> well, I passed by, I said, sweet Jesus, God, you are a good God. <laughs> you ain't never looked at somebody and said, thanks. <laughs> are y'all with me? Now, now, I want you to catch what he said. He, first of all, he says, a living, it's a living sacrifice. And, and I want you to look at what he says. Now, a living sacrifice can't be presented to God if it ain't holy. Because he just, he just doesn't say, it's not the new age of, of, of Western theology where it just, just uh, God knows who I am. No, he wants a holy presentation because if he wouldn't take a ram that was messed up, he, you can't keep presenting a funky life. You remember last week I told you we got to get musty. Be right, be, get the right must. So he, he uses three words here. Living is a deliberate ongoing sacrifice given again and again over time. Now, put those notes up there. Uh, holy and undefiled offering dedicated exclusive, there it is, exclusively to the Lord and his purpose. Okay, so y'all remember they would get the, the goats and they were, the rams or the, the, the uh, lamb and they would pull it out. Well, they had lambs that were set aside just for sacrifice. What he's, what he's actually saying is, since your money doesn't impress God, since your titles don't impress God, your degrees don't impress God, where you live don't impress God, what impresses God is when you present a life that's holy, that you set aside for God. Do you view your life as set aside for God? Do you, do you view your life as something that was set aside for the glory of God? Could you imagine how different your life would be today if every day you viewed it as it needs to be on purpose? I ain't talking about your gift. I'm not talking about your Sunday gift. No, 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 no. I mean, you could be the best greeter in the world. No, I'm talking about you live on purpose so that you can see what God wants you to see. 
and you want to hear what God wants you to hear so you can say what God wants you to say. So you want to know why the church, you know, you, don't raise your hand, but you know why the reason uh, a lot of our children don't go to church anywhere is because we have trouble. We, have, we good living, but it's the holy. You can tell where you stand with God by watching your children. Let me sit that down for a second. I know mine is still young, 18, but I pray that he presents his life because he saw more than just Sunday. Man, I would be a failure. Forget having a packed out church. If Blake didn't believe, because he don't believe because of what he hears on Sunday. No, he just thinks that's what daddy does. They, they asked him one time when he was about in the third grade, what does your daddy do? You know, why, uh, I almost said, why, uh, they always want to know what your daddy do. And, my, and Blake told him, he talked to the people. <laughs> they wanted to know, who are you talking to? I said, none of your business. If you ain't paying my mortgage, I don't care what. All he sees is I talk to the people. But at home, he ought to see living holy. That don't mean living perfect. Cause daddy done said some stuff. He done made me mad enough to say some stuff. But I, I, I also, when I sin, I repent openly so he can hear it. Are y'all with me? And the older I get, the less repenting I have to do in front of him. Now I, rep now I admit it in my own heart. <laughs> this brother in lost his mind. I can't, I can't touch him like I used to. That joke was strong. <clears throat> now I'll tell you that the last time I tried to hit him. He put them hands up and boy, I hit his hands. No hands didn't move. I told him, I, I got to shoot this boy. <laughs> so, so here it is. Here it is. You got to live holy so you can be accepted. Now let, let me let me let me explain this. You're not working to be accepted. I want to be very careful here. You're not working to please God. No. Because if you go work to please God, you wouldn't need the cross. No, no. No. This is a result of the work that was done. Well, we don't have to coax y'all to give. Shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to trick folks to give. You give because that's a part of your worship. Because you look back over your life and see what God has done for you, and you can't help but to present. I'm not only presenting money, I'm presenting a life. And I present that life that I check my life with his will to make sure he receives it. What is acceptable? A well-pleasing sacrifice is that it honors God's character. You can't present something to God that's outside of God's character and expect for him to receive it. It's something when they bring up something about a person you reject it because you know the person's character. Amen. I hope if they, if somebody came to you and said, Pastor, chasing women. Mercy. Sister James would say, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> when you, you, why are you looking down? Look up. <laughs> Look right at me. Not, not, not Pastor. Why? Because you should know my character. It's something you ought to reject. Amen. You, you, because trustworthiness over years. Now, if you keep hearing it from different people, you might want to check it. Yeah. <laughs> people who has not corroborated their stories. <laughs> Any gift you give to God ought to match God's character. So I can't hate and present a gift to a loving God. I can't cut people off and present a sacrifice to a long-suffering God. <clears throat> I can't be negative and step in front of a joyful God. 
I can't be creating chaos and present a gift in front of a peaceful God. So everything I present to God ought to match his character. If you don't know his character, read his word. If you go back to Romans chapter 8, if you go back to Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 5, you find out he loves you even before you did not love yourself. That's the character of God. He, he wants to have fellowship with you. He wants, but if you are living a life that does not match his character, you're asking him to accept a faulty gift. Are y'all with me? So, so every day you got, to, you got to wake up, not just on Sunday, not on May 18, May 19, saying, Lord, this is my day to sacrifice. No, every day you ought to wake up in the morning when God wakes you up and say, how can I sacrifice for you today? How can I please you today? Are you, did you make God smile today? Are you with me? Okay, so here it is. The first verse number one says, and I'll let you go. I beseech you, therefore, I beg you, brothers, and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, one that's holy unto God, which is your reasonable service. I love that part when he says, which is, that's reasonable. Yeah. That's simply the word. That, that makes a lot of sense to present. Verse number two says, here's where we're going to spend some time. And he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he uses two words here I want to look at. I can't pronounce them, but it is the word we get, the human word that we get means schematic, uh, scheme. Uh, when you look at the word conform, you have to look at how this world schemes to mess up our minds. But God's scheme is to transform your mind. You know why people conform to the world? Because of fear. One of the hardest things it is to do is to stand out. And what makes us stand out now is not what made us stand out in the 80s. You, you might be confused on what I'm saying. Uh, let me give you a case in point. When I was growing up off of 5028J, Miss Hill, lived next door, could come outside and tell everybody, go home. Now we might mumble under our breath, but we would we'd go home. You know, you know what I'm saying? She could chastise us and whoop us. Every, everybody on the street had the right. Because you trusted everybody. But now, because we are being transformed to the world, we don't whoop our kids. We talk to them. Well, they're expressing themselves. You express yourself when you get grown. That, won't be, that would be one expression at my house. You, you catch what I'm saying? Yeah, when you get your own mortgage, express yourself all day long. But here, you keep your, you transform by what you think, but not what you say. Now, let, let me, you know, it was rare to hear people living together before they were married when I was seven, in the 70s. Now it's rare. This is, it's, it's I can't remember the last wedding I've done. Don't, don't, don't get mad. I can't think of the last wedding I've done where there were already generated ring bearers and flower bearers. You don't have to go look for a cousin. Have I gone too far, Mama McCracken? She's scratching her head already. You, you don't have to go way out to look for somebody. It's all in the family. What, what are you saying? The world has normalized wrong. This is my we ain't never we ain't never had to convict a president. Well, we ain't never had one like this one. I mean, if we getting worse and worse, and I ain't saying another one is bad, but I'm just saying somewhere along the way, you ought to have some type of standard of morality that 
So, so because we don't read the word of God anymore, the standard becomes the world. That, that, that becomes the standard. And so what's so good about the standard of the world, you don't have to stretch to reach it. You just get up and live, and you have met the standard. But when you read the word of God, you find out there is a better standard, and this standard generates peace. Are oh, y'all catching what I'm saying? So what he's saying is that when you know the schemes of the world and you see the plan of God, your reasonable service is to do what God has said. That's, that's why we are believers. We are believers because we want to go to heaven, but also we are a royal priesthood where God wants to show what it looks like to be 80 and comfortable. Uh, you know, that's, that's what a good life of good decisions have made. It is well with your soul. You don't let stuff fall apart. You don't let stuff knock you out. You are, you are sound in God because you're sound in his word. And what you do is you present yourself so other people who are younger, who are trying to figure out this God thing, can see your life and see that that standard is an uh, easier standard because it's God's standard. And because you can't expect God to work everything out when you won't believe in what works it out. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. Getting pre preaching is getting harder every year. I'm, I'm trying to tell you, you know why? Because people don't believe truth. I see it on people's face. When I started preaching 23 years ago, it, the look of people's face is different than it was when I started. Say amen, Doc. Doc, doc say amen. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'll be talking about just some simple things. Don't lie. And people looking at you like. <laughs> right, next Monday, I'll pick up and call Edward Jones and find out. Now, when can I retire? <laughs> I mean, when I talk to people in the office, man, they sin is different than the sins I'm used to. They bring some crazy stuff into the house. I'm, I'm trying to help somebody. Why? Because we have allowed the world to set the standard. But the world standard includes damnation. It don't work out. It doesn't, it doesn't work out on your favor. It might feel good now, but you are going to get hot later. I believe that because you can't believe in God's grace and think God just going to save everybody. And then he says, then you, 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 if you don't live right and you don't set a standard, then you're going to have trouble on your hands, for especially those who don't believe in Jesus Christ. So if you can believe in a heaven, how can you reject a hell? That don't make sense. He says, and be not conformed to this world. But how do I change myself? How do I change myself? To be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the word metamorphe. Uh, I can pronounce that one. Doc, uh, give them, the, give them the, the Greek word for uh, schematic. I couldn't pronounce it. It's right here. But y'all look it up. It's in 4964 in your Strong's book. What is, what is metamorphe? I, I know who I am. I don't try to do all that Greek stuff. I can't pronounce it. I'm having trouble with the English language. <laughs> so don't be something <laughs> up there talking all big and stuff. I can't say and, if, and but. So what, what does it mean? What does it mean to transform? Metamorph? It, it is the English word a metamorphosis. You know what metamorphosis is? That's to change. So how do I change? Now, get, can I talk about how to change? Um, and I am not trying to speak negatively about any system, any church, any pastor. That's not what I'm talking about. But if church is not created to make you think, it is an emotional salve to ignore your pain. Like, now, now, when you come to church, I don't mind us jumping and hollering and running around. That, that doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me. But if you, if you run and never stop to think. And some of us run at the wrong time. 
If you start off the service running, you ought to run because of what you've heard. Now let me let me let me talk to us out of my out of my black context. I love us. I love us. But our churches come out of a sniffing of slavery. So a lot of it would come the only time you could be separate from the master was when you had church and they would allow you to dress up and that's why we wore three piece suits and all that good stuff and and, and my good Baptist brothers, I love them. They still, when I go over there to preach for them, I, I'm, I'm suited and booted. You know, uh, There's it, not, nothing wrong with it, nothing wrong with it. But, but here's the problem. Uh, an emotional relationship with God doesn't make you change. That's why John 4 says, you got to worship him in spirit and truth. Okay, to have the spirit but not the truth you'll start talking some languages. And you'll start acting up for the show, but not for the change. Actually, true worship is when you think. Because when I think, I start changing. And when I start changing, then I can start praising. Because when I think, I start thinking. Are y'all with me? If I'm thinking without thinking, what am I thinking for? <laughs> okay, y'all, 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 what, what, what are you saying, Pastor? What are you saying? Here it is in verse number two. I got to go. I got to go. It wasn't saying in verse number two. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How should I renew my mind? Go back to verse number one every day. Not once a week. That's why you ought to have a personal word in with you. You ought to read God's word. I got to do it every day because the world is informing me every day. So I got to combat the daily confirmation of the world with the confirming of the word. So if you're only getting the word on Sunday, but you're getting the word world for six days, who's winning? Yeah, how do I don't know what's winning? What I'm feeding the most? Turn off that Facebook, turn off that television, and in the morning, get in the Word. What, uh, get, get in the Word and see what the Word is trying to say. For, and then when you get out in the world, you can know what is of the Word. Are y'all with me? I'm trying to help somebody. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. You don't know what's good without the word. One John, one five through six says, "This then is the <laughs> this then is the message we have heard of him, and we declare unto you that God is light, and in him there ain't no darkness. But if we say that we have fellowship with him." But you exuding darkness, you lying. Truth ain't in you. Romans seven fourteen says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Well, I'm, I'm still human and I'm a slave to sin. Romans chapter 8, verse number 11 says, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ, Jesus, from the dead, he will give you life in your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. How do I beat the devil? By letting the spirit reside. Not where the money reside. Let the spirit reside. That means not, not, not visit. You got to stop letting the spirit visit. That's the problem. You, you let the spirit visit on Sundays. When the message goes, no, you got to let the spirit dwell. Y'all yeah. know the difference in dwelling? Mama Mackey taught me that. Mama Mackey, good to see you. in Mama Mackey looking beautiful today? Uh, Mama Mackey taught me that. Mama Mackey, do you remember that tea you used to make me? Your mama, mama used to put something special in that tea. I was preaching real good back then. <laughs> I used to holler with that mama. You remember that? Ha, ha, ha. I was giving it all to, because mama was mixing some stuff together. But I told Mama, take that, take that tea bag out. She said, no, no, no. You got to let that tea bag stay in there because it's more to come out. If you just dipping, you got bitter water. But when you let the bag go, <laughs> it can pull everything 
that was in there out. Some of us dipping with the spirit. But boy, if you ever let the bag go, God can get out of you. Everything he put in you. So look, look, when you understand verse number one and two, when you understand verse number one and two, you start understanding some questions. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll gave, gave us, uh, they might have been Chuck, uh, A.W. Toast gave us some questions that all of this answers. Here's some questions we've all had. What is the meaning of life? Verse one and two. What makes a man or a woman great? Comes out of verse one and two. Who or what determines right and wrong? Comes out of verse one and two. How should one respond when I've been offended? It comes out of verse one and two. What determines a person's worth? It comes out of verse one and two. Why, uh, why do kind people suffer while cruel people prosper? comes out of verse 1 and 2. Every question you have about life can be answered out of Romans chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2, because I'm presenting my body as a living sacrifice so God can, Jesus can present me in front of his Father and I can hear those marvelous words, well done my good and faithful servant. My good and faithful servant. So, so what, are, what are you trying to say? First number one, uh, here's your sum, here's your summation. Uh, uh, what are you presenting? What are you presenting? In verse number two, what are you changing? What are you presenting? And what are you changing? How do I change, Pastor? Think. What am I thinking on? What he said. And when I get with what he said, it'll change the way I think. And if I change the way I think, I can present something different. Y'all with me? I've been having sciatic nerve pain. I've been, and, and boy, have y'all ever had that sciatic right there? Right down that back? And my, my, my dealer is tripping. My dealer hadn't sent my shipment in yet, Brother Bell. <laughs> y'all remember Brother Smart used to walk like this? Look at Brother Smart. <laughs> I said, I want what he got. <laughs> Brother Smart used to walk in the church like this. Now he just. <laughs> I had to ask Brother Smart, who touched you with the Spirit of God? He said, there was no touch. Was <laughs> At all, it's amazing. <laughs> but when I went to my doctor, when I went to my doctor, he said, man, you, you, you tripping. He called me Rev. He, he went to seminary for a while and he left seminary. Smart decision went and became a doctor. And he always asked church questions. One thing, good thing about it, he respect what I do because when I'm sick, I can get in there immediately. Can't rush on. I mean, I can call him today. I can, he, come on, Rev. That's what he says when I get there. Let the Rev in here because he's trying to save some souls. <laughs> well, I don't have to sit in the waiting room and all that stuff. He, he told me, I mean, I can keep shooting you with these, uh, with these uh, steroids. It'll loosen you up. It'll loosen you up, but you're gaining weight. He said, what's happening is what's in the front of you is pulling on what's on the back of you. Right? And I said, you mind your own business. <laughs> you ain't looking that healthy yourself. <laughs> so you know what I had to do? I had to stop rejecting truth, and I started living it. Mm -hmm. So he gave me some medicine I'm taking, but I got to eat before I take it. I left the house early. My niece had a meeting. She was on a Zoom call, so there wasn't no breakfast made. So my normal thing would be to stop at the McDonald's right there in Red Oak. You know, right there to the left. Uh, so I stopped by McDonald's, but when I got in line, you know what I had to do? I had to talk to myself. Right? Yeah. I said, I got to eat because I can't take the medicine without eating it. It messes up my stomach. But I don't have to eat what I normally do. So I had to think. I didn't have to stop at McDonald's, but don't worry about that. I had to think. And I said, I'm not going to get the Egg McMuffin. I'm not going to get that, that, uh, that thing with the pancake. I said, I'm going to get oatmeal. I looked at it, and it was only 125 calories. The other meals are my calories for the whole day. Now, I won in that moment, but I got lunch coming up, and I'm hungry. So what I got to do is go back and represent. Yeah. 
Because one time ain't a reward from God. So every day, I've already decided. I've already pulled up where the restaurant I got to meet these preachers at. And I already decided because I can't go in there not thinking. Are y'all with me? That's what life is. Have, you wouldn't have made the mistakes that you made if you thought before you did. You wouldn't have gone where you went if you didn't think. Thinking changes things. That's all Jesus, that's all Paul is trying to bring to our identity. Think, think. Because he talks about later on in, in Philippians, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things of honest report. Think on these things. And it'll change your whole dichotomy of who you are as a child of God. Amen? Amen. 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 All right.